Right, great. I think that means that we are live now um, for our very first CJS seminar of uh, 2022. Um, and so today we are delighted to be reunited, albeit virtually, with the wonderful Dr. Raina Dennison. Um, and after an amazing career, which she's pretty much written and edited everything on film, anime and television, um, including book publications, superheroes on world screens and anime, a critical introduction. They were both published in 2015. So I, how on earth did you manage that? And Raina is now... Right, OK. Um, uh, she is now Professor in Film and Digital Arts at the University of Bristol. She is currently working on a project about Studio Ghibli's industrial history, and I'm pretty sure there's another book coming out of this, isn't there? So today, Rain is going to be talking to us about Studio Ghibli and specifically director Miyazaki Hayao's reputation for creating strong heroines and whether this reputation stacks up through her investigation of the women who worked behind the scenes in the production of the 1992 film Porto Rosso or Kurenai no Buta. So thank you very much, Raina. Big welcome to you. And uh, just a reminder to our audience, after uh, Raina's presentation, we will be asking you um, for your questions to put to Raina. So um, if, you, if one occurs to you while she's uh, talking, um, please feel free to uh, just type that out and pop it in our Q&A box or in the chat. OK, thank you very much. Thank you all so much for coming along. It is wonderful to be back at UEA, even if it's only virtually. I wish I was there with you in Norwich, but soon. I hope I will come back again and, and visit with you all. Um, to other friends who've come along today, welcome to this talk. It comes out of a book project that I've just been working to complete. Um, the book should be out sometime this year or early next year. And the book's on the industrial history of Studio Ghibli, which means kind of taking a different view of the studio than the ones we usually see of um, Haya Miyazaki. Um, and so one of the things I've been trying to do in the book is unpack some of the myths around Studio Ghibli, the big claims that are always made, the big myths that are always told. And one of those is to do with Miyazaki being a feminist filmmaker um, or creating these feminist heroines for his films. And you see this everywhere. If you type Hayao Miyazaki and feminism into Google, you'll get hundreds of responses, but articles in places from The Guardian to Harper's Bazaar and The Atlantic, for example. So this is a common thread in the discourse around the studio, and I wanted to think about it in slightly different terms and try and think about what happens if we, if we engage with all aspects of potential feminism at Studio Ghibli. So most people talking about Studio Ghibli would start with Miyazaki's shoujo heroines, his young girl heroines. Um, these have been very popular characters from across the studio's 35 year plus history now. And we, we see a range of, as you can see in the, the image on the slide here, a range of different heroines um, in terms of looks, in terms of activities, but they, they tend to be talked about in relation to feminism, perhaps particularly um, characters like Sun from Princess Mononoke, the heroine from that film, who has been, across her history, everything from a problematically violent young female character to a feminist icon. And there's a great article in a, in a book I edited on Princess Mononoke by Emma Pett talking about that transformation in San's reputation. So I wanted to think a little bit more about Miyazaki's feminist characters and to think a little bit more about how we might unpack them. Certainly his feminist character or his female characters, sorry, are very active. They are often the agents of the movies. They move the story along. But for me, there, there also is an edge of conservatism in there. So many of his female characters, including um, Satsuki from My Neighbor Totoro, Kiki from Kiki's Delivery Service, Sophie's from Howl, um, Howl's Moving Castle, and others are shown quite regularly doing things like domestic work, cleaning, um, household chores. And part of that, as Susan Napier argues, might be a response by Miyazaki to his own personal history. When Miyazaki was young, his mother was ill, and so he was left with the other children in the family to do the domestic chores. And he sees this as a measure, I think, of, of childhood activity and, and responsibility. 
So there's question marks I have there about Miyazaki's feminist characters and these young girls. They seem often to be battling against the, the worlds in which they are heroines. But I think if we look at some of his other characters, we might see different lenses that he's taking on feminism. Um, in particular, I love Miyazaki's old ladies. They are fabulous characters, um, but they are really interesting to think about in terms of the disparities between their actions within Hayao Miyazaki's films and the way they look. Often Miyazaki's older women are, as you can see here with Zaniba from uh, Spirited Away and with Dola from Castle in the Sky, um, his older female characters can be something of or take on a kind of grotesque sort of appearance. And that I think is problematic as well. However, um, these are, I think, characters in which Miyazaki unleashes feminine power. Um, we see Dola leading an army of sky pirates. We see Zaniba um, as a very powerful witch enacting change within the narrative. So there's a real positivity to his old women and a freedom from societal restrictions and expectations. In addition to those older characters, I think there's also been secondary characters within Miyazaki's films who've been a little bit overlooked. So people like Ursula from Kiki's Delivery Service, who acts as a mentor and a guide, and almost as a counselor to Kiki, the protagonist, when Kiki is struggling with uh, a form of childhood depression. It's her visits to Ursula in the woods that help her to overcome that depression. And as you can see on the screen here, Ursula gives her all kinds of, of good advice about mental health and about how to move forward into maturity. One of the issues there though, is that Ursula herself is depicted as outside of society, as not being part of it, but um, working from the fringes and margins of society. So I think that leads me to a last character I wanted to look at or a character type and that's um, what I like to call Miyazaki's cameo feminists. Um, so you get these wonderfully um, brief moments of overt feminism in some of Miyazaki's films. For example, in this scene from Castle in the Sky, Okami, the, um, the wife of the leader of a mining community at the beginning of the, the film, Castle in the Sky, is shown for a brief moment talking to the shoujo protagonist um, Shita and the young male protagonist, uh, shonen protagonist um, Pazu. She leads them through her house and in this blink and you'll miss it moment from the film, we see her surrounded by um, mining posters that invoke the uh, miner strike from the 1980s in Wales. And so she's a really interesting character. She's very strong and depicted as physically strong, but also she's the equal to her partner, and she's also surrounded by this kind of imagery of communism, which is fascinating and I think deserves further attention. But these are the kinds of characters that often don't get mentioned, and I think they're all of them taken together kind of make a nice narrative about the different layers to Miyazaki's approach to women characters and potential feminism. However, today, I kind of want to reflect on the fact that all of this might be a trap. Um, much of the analysis of Ghibli's women to date has fallen into the same trap that Jane M. Gaines has identified regarding early feminist histories of film. Gaines argues that these feminist histories of Hollywood film made their claims based on women's rep representations on screen, but not on the presence of real women behind the scenes in the film industry. Gaines' argument might well be applied to the previous readings I've just done of Ghibli's feminism. By focusing on women's representations within the films, we've kind of written out women behind the scenes within the studio for, in preference for, the stories of women on our screens. And this is something that Erin Hill talks about in her work on um, women behind the scenes in Hollywood cinema and their history across the, the kind of early period of Hollywood film history. And she's right, it's not that these women behind the scenes are invisible, it's that we have, as academics, as scholars, often chosen to look at the women on screen versus thinking about um, what women are doing behind the scenes, which is often less glamorous work. So what I wanted to do today then is just to start thinking through some of these slightly more overlooked representations. <clears throat> 
And indeed, um, beyond Ghibli, Japan's animation industry still only contains a small number of women um, at the, the tops of the industry, mostly found overseeing occasional television anime episodes. They're accompanied by a vanishingly small number of women who act as anime showrunners or as anime film directors. Uh, a notable exception exists in Kyoto Animation, or KyoAni, founded by uh, husband and wife team Yoko and Hideaki Hata in 1981, because they've been actively promoting women at their studio, leading to the high profile success of Naoko Yamada in recent years with films like A Silent Voice that you can see pictured on the left of this slide, and Liz and the Bluebird. But as with the US animation industry, anime success has been built on the back of a more or less overlooked female workforce. Kathy Monroe Hotez's um, online project offers a much needed amount of visibility for and insight into women's contributions to Japanese animation. And more archival historical work is beginning to reveal the roles women have played behind the scenes in anime and beyond. For example, Jason Cody Douglas's paper at the Society for Animation Studies conference in 2021 uh, about the hidden contributions of Tadahito Mochinaga's wife, Ayoko, and I have an image here that is of um, Tadahito Mochinaga, who's a famous stop motion animator, Tei Wei, an animator from China, and Osamu Tezuka with two unnamed women. And I don't know if one of them is Ayoko, but I certainly hope so, because it's very difficult to find any images of her. Um, so, sorry, oh, just going back to the story. So Ayoko um, Mochinaga has made a huge impact impact on Mochi, uh, Tadahiko, uh, Tadahito Mochinaga's filmmaking in Japan, but she's very rarely credited and is almost invisible um, outside of the archives that the animator himself held. Diane Way Lewis has also investigated how animation has been outsourced to housewives in the 1970s and 80s in Japan, pushing women even further into the margins of animation production and sometimes actually defrauding them, not just exploiting them. So that brings me to Porco Rosso or Kuranai no Buta, which came out in 1992. And when it did its cinema program or pamphletetto, declared that the film had been made, and I quote, by an army of beautiful women. For animation scholars, this phrasing will have a familiar ring, echoing the language used in promotional behind the scenes films made by the Walt Disney Company as early as 1937 around Snow White in which they described the pretty girls at work in their ink and paint department. Promotional films from the time shows, um, and it, from, the 1930, from 1937 till at least the 1941 mixed live action animated film, The Reluctant Dragon, um, manufacture a fantasy at Disney, a fantasy version of the working condition, conditions for women's at the Disney studios a fantasy built around the idea of them being utopianly clean, bright, and beautiful. The reality, of course, was different. Women were routinely held back from advancement in the animation industry's early years, and in the same period that those films were being made, Disney's workers went on a bitter strike in the early, um, late 1930s, early 1940s, in part in protest at the gross inequalities between wages offered to men and women, and because of the pressurized working conditions in this era of Disney production. So you would think that by the 1980s, when Studio Ghibli was formed, that this was all different and that the anime industry would be different too. But actually Miyazaki himself tells stories about, um, in particular, a woman who worked in animation checking, someone who looks at the final versions to make sure all the animated cells are done correctly. Um, and he tells this story about her working six, seven days a week, 70 to 100 hours a week, never having a break, and then basically working until she was hospitalized, going into hospital, having a nice rest for a week, and coming back and doing it all again. So there was a huge amount of exploitation um, for women, even in the 1980s, 70s, and 80s, when Miyazaki started in the animation industry. And though Studio Ghibli is different to Disney, it might not be as different as you'd expect. Take, for example, um, these murals, uh, or this particular mural, in the Studio Ghibli Art Museum in the Mitaka. So this was created in the early 2000s, and it's a series of rooms with a series of murals. Um, one shows um, a largely, and there's multiple ones showing largely segregated forms of um, 
labor being done at the studio. Male animators hard at work drawing while women are pictured here, as you can see on the slide, cheerfully filling in cells surrounded by a rainbow's worth of colored paints. Ghibli, just as much as Disney before it, enacts fantasies about the work undertaken by both genders. For women, the image produced can be iniquitous, resting as much on looks as talent and reducing women's contributions to subordinate, if not subaltern states. So what I'm trying to do here is argue for a fuller conceptualization of Studio Ghibli's working culture and films. In particular, I want to pass the contributions made by Studio Ghibli's female workforce, both the visible and maybe in some cases, the less obvious. So you can get a sense of some of this here. So by the time of Porco Rosso in 1992, Studio Ghibli was already investing in women, but most obviously as characters and as audiences rather than as creators. Women's importance can be seen, for example, when in addition to proclaiming that the film was made by an army of beautiful women, the cinema program for Porco Rosso also announced that the new film would surprise audiences because, and I quote, this would be the third women's film continuing on from Majo or Kiki's Delivery Service and Memory or Omoide, um, which is only yesterday by Isao Takahata. The importance of women is clear in the former two, perhaps with their female heroines, but less so for Porco Rosso, which Miyazaki has also described at the time as his hobby film about airplanes. Kiki's delivery service had adapted Eiko Kadano's book of the same name, and it places a young female witch in training at the heart of its narrative. In the same kind of vein, Only Yesterday, or Omoide Poroporo Poro by Isao Takahata from 1991, had interspersed childhood flashbacks into the story of an adult woman adapted from the adventure, a, a manga by Hotaru Okamoto and Yuko Tone. Porco Rosso was, despite being about the adventures of a porcine zoomorphized human pilot, um, also a women's film, however, in as much as its heroic pilot Marco, sometimes called Porco, is caught in a mismatched and ultimately unresolvable love triangle between shoujo mechanic Theo and the adult singer resistance fighter Gina, who's pictured in the poster here. However, I argue that as far as production discourse is concerned, Porco Rosso can also be read as a third in a trilogy of successful women's films made by Studio Ghibli because it was in this film that women finally came to the fore within Studio Ghibli's production culture. Further, it was in creating these three films that Studio Ghibli finally freed itself from its initial debt and was able to build its own studio buildings, making Porco Rosso the culmination of Miyazaki's ambitions for his studio, a permanent staff working within a permanent location for productions. Women as characters, audiences, but just as significantly as creators made this change possible at Studio Ghibli. So the success of Kiki's delivery service made it possible to redefine the studio's employment norms. And a quote from Toshio Suzuki here, in 1990, Studio Ghibli adopted the policy of putting all companies and uh, all company employees on a fixed salary, in addition to periodically hiring and educating new personnel. As a consequence, Isao Takahata's Only Yesterday became the first Studio Ghibli film made by a permanently contracted staff. Toshio Suzuki, Studio Ghibli's um, CEO and sometimes president and main producer, goes on to report that somewhere in this confluence of events, Miyazaki was doing three things at once. He was producing only yesterday while starting work on Porco Rosso and at the same time designing the permanent studio buildings which would house Studio Ghibli's production teams. And that's pictured on the slide here. One of the anecdotes um, about Miyazaki's designs that Suzuki seems to relish telling, I found it in two or three different places, runs as follows. Mia-san went into overdrive. While working simultaneously on Porco Rosso, he drew up studio floor plans, negotiated repeatedly with the construction company, and acquired and checked samples of the materials to be used. Particularly characteristic of Mia-san was the fact that, although the proportion of female to male employees was nearly equal, the women's restroom was about double in size. So he loves telling that story, and it's, it's fascinating to think about why. The investment in space exclusively for women, I think is significant. Um, 
as was the later decision to add a crash to the studio. And this may be actually the clearest manifestation of Miyazaki's actual feminist practices. Toilets may not be the most glamorous of feminist statements, but this is a sign that Miyazaki was overtly recognizing and responding to what he perceived as barriers to women's participation in the studio's rented accommodation. So I think I'll just leave that section there because I don't want to run over time, but I wanted to move on to think about how women made this film and who these this army of beautiful women might have been. So I think more important by far than the new women's toilets at Studio Ghibli was Miyazaki's decision to promote women already working for him at Studio Ghibli when making Porco Rosso. Porco Rosso really was a film made by women in as much as the main staff was almost exclusively comprised of women. Key animator Megumi Kagawa was promoted to animation director. Kazuo Oga's mentee Katsu or Kazu Hisamura became the film's art director. Naoko Asari was hired in to be a sound designer. Kitomi Tateno took charge of animation checking assisted by Rie Fujimura and Rie Nakagomi who supported her. And Teruyo Tateyama and Ikuyo Kimura both trained by Michio Yasuda, one of Ghibli's most prominent female um, employees did the color design. Using women across most of the film's significant roles is unusual for Studio Ghibli, and it's tempting to see this as an over, over, overtly feminist move by Miyazaki and his producers. But it is difficult to be sure of the motivations behind this remarkably inclusive female lineup of staff. When asked about his choice to promote these seven women, Miyazaki replied that, it wasn't because they were women. When I decided to judge everyone accurately on their abilities, sometimes they just happened to be women. This meritocratic statement has a dual function, emphasizing the high quality of even those operating at the lower levels of Studio Ghibli, while distancing Miyazaki from the promotional discourse about this film being made by women. The fact that so many of those promoted by to the main staff for Paul Carrasso happen to be women can be read in multiple ways, therefore. First as a testament to the large numbers of women usually working at the mid-level of Studio Ghibli. Second, it could be read as a sign of a lack of norma normal or normative career advancement opportunities at the studio, which had caused many of their women um, workers' careers to stall at the midpoint of Studio Ghibli's hierarchies. I think in addition to that, we might also think about and see all of this as a carefully orchestrated publicity stunt by Toshio Suzuki. I think we see this reflected in the sometimes leading questions of the promotional campaigns around Porco Rosso, where journalists seem to have followed very much um, Toshio Suzuki's line about how this is a, a film made by beautiful women. So the women of Ghibli appear throughout the studio's promotional landscapes, um, featuring in interviews, popping up be in behind the scenes, behind the scenes videos, and even in one case spotlighted as the inspiration behind one of Miyazaki's most popular characters, or one of his more overlooked female uh, feminist characters, I should say. An article in Animage in 19, 19, 1989 contains a photograph of key animator Megumi Kagawa at her desk, flanked on the page by images of Kiki and her mentor character, Ursula. Underneath these images is an excerpt from Miyazaki's storyboards for Kiki's delivery service. In the accompanying text, Miyazaki explains um, the traits, sorry, um, the there's a storyboard notation which likens Ursula to Kagawa. Miyazaki says that he often uses the traits of Studio Ghibli staff members as a shorthand way to characterize um, the characters in his films. In this case, it was Kagawa's laughter and her careful way of living that were taken as inspirations for Kiki's older friend, Ursula. Kagawa is defined through these associations with Ursula, not just in the case of Kiki's dis delivery service, but also afterwards too. Kagawa's laughter, for example, according to the cinema program for Porco Rosso, was a defining feature of Studio Ghibli's productions. Um, and this is a, a nice quote from Animage again. There is an animation, there is animation director Megumi Kagawa, who reminds us of Ursula, the cheerful, open-hearted painter, who is like a big sister in Kiki's delivery service. Even if you're at the opposite end of the main studio, you can hear Megumi Kagawa's hearty laughter. <laughs> 
while the associations are positive, Kagawa becomes, I think, a little bit caricaturized or, or essentialized in these accounts. And her similarity to Ursula overwhelms other potential readings of her as a professional animator, as a key animator, or even as an animation director at Studio Ghibli. When asked about this comparison to Ursula, Kagawa herself demurs and has often changed the subject. Um, told that she was like Ursula, for example, she responds, is that right? I wonder if we're all that similar. I'm indecisive and I think I'm not as efficient as her. But for me, Ursula was an easy character to draw. This is a considered statement from Kagawa that deflects from the studio's attempts to, to, to conflate on-screen characters with their real world creators, while simultaneously asserting her authorship and centrality to the production process. So I think there's a really interesting way in which some of Studio Ghibli's animators over the years, particularly the female ones, have attempted to reclaim the narrative around feminism for themselves. These differing positions are complicated by a seven women round table, sorry, seven woman round table interview about the making of Porco Rosso that was reproduced in um, the Ghibli textbook. So it's been, it's had a long kind of reproduced life, but it at first appeared in the Roman album for Porco Rosso. It features the main staff members, the main female staff members from Porco Rosso, with the exception of sound designer Naoko Asari. Some of the questions asked of these female professionals are actually, even for the 1980s and 90s, a little bit surprising, if not shocking. For example, one of, of the questions from um, the Roman album team asks these female animators whether they feel their gender is the equivalent to being handicapped. Hitomi Tateno robustly refutes this idea. But she does allow that, and I quote, if you're asking about being a woman in general, it's separate. But I think it is the, I, but I think it is the opposite and women are very valued here at Ghibli. However, all of the women agree that the long working hours require a commitment to the studio that prevents them from having much of a life outside of animation. As Susan Napier has argued, such sentiments meant that women working in animation in Japan at the time were finding their choices curtailed because, and I quote, while many animation industry employees were female, they usually had to give up any thought of marriage or family if they wanted to stay in the industry. So while the situation for women at Ghibli was certainly an improvement on the kinds of iniquitous contracts that women had to sign when working um, you know, earlier in, in animation history in Japan, for many women, the experience of working in animation remain, remained in practice still fairly um, iniquitous. Sorry, um, I'm just gonna move slightly out of the sun. <laughs> there we go. Um, right. So this is an interesting um, image that I've had to choose. So now Kawasari worked with Studio Ghibli on their animated music video um, on your mark, but I wasn't able to find a a photograph of her to use for this talk because she hasn't been featured in Studio Ghibli's publicity materials. Um, so just to, to carry on, um, Kagawa does defend the studio during this round table and does so by comparing her experience of working at Ghibli to her work in television anime. Kagawa claims that television anime was, and I quote, tougher, though to the point where it made me cry. I would throw up, she says, after staying up all night working. There was no free time to sleep on the television series. So this time I didn't feel like throwing up. So in that sense, clearly it was easier. And then she, she does an uncomfortable laugh to finish the quotation. This description of working conditions outside of Studio Ghibli, I think leaves a harrowing impression of the animators working lives elsewhere in Japan's animation industry. It does not suggest that things at Studio Ghibli were always good but they were viewed as an improvement on other working conditions at the time. Kagawa's statement may also help to explain why women would choose to stay at mid-level positions at Ghibli rather than trying for advancement outside of the studio. The round is also revealing about the main characters, the main staff's feelings on being compared to women of the Piccolo family, the factory workers um, featured in Porco Rosso that I used for the, the promotional image for this, move, uh, for this talk. Rie Hujimura and Megumi Kagawa, for example, immediately disagree during the roundtable about the messages that these scenes of women in the Piccolo factory might send to audiences regarding the women working at Studio Ghibli. 
Fujimura worries that having a male staff member or a male family member in charge of the factory who comments um, on his female staff to Marco makes it sound like they are something easy to use. Kagawa replies a little defensively and deflects away from Fujimura's criticism by claiming that, but don't you, def don't you feel like Fio will take over? It would be strange if Fio didn't take over. So Fio is the brilliant young mechanic who helps fix Marco's seaplane when he brings it to the Piccolo factory for repair. And she demands to travel with Marco, becoming the film's secondary love interest. Though she, is always remain, she always remains a kind of independent, capable female character. So while the group of female animators reaches consensus about the scene's potentially troubling attributes, this exchange, I think, displays the tensions um, the women working on the film felt about having their real world experiences likened to the abstracted, idealized, and patriarchal story world they were creating. A tension presides here between what Napier calls Porco Rosso's wish fulfilling male fantasy and the realities of women who work to realize its completion. So examining how the women who make Studio Ghibli's films discuss their positions within the studio as it became successful introduces another critical labor story to Studio Ghibli's industrial history. Without question, women report enjoying working at Studio Ghibli but it's not without its costs. Long hours, no holidays, no time for social life or home life, and relatively little opportunity for advancement. After Porco Rosso, almost all of the seven women in the roundtable discussion went back to their previous production roles. Kazuhisa Mura, pictured here, um, the art director on Porco Rosso had already been an assistant art director, but she quickly returned to working as a background artist after Porco Rosso. Megumi Kagawa fared a little better. Uh, she became animation director on Ponyo or Gake no, no Ue no Ponyo in 2008 and was assistant animation director for Hiramasa Yonibayashi's directorial debut, Arietti, in 2010. But thereafter, Kagawa returned to her key animation work, mostly on big anime films, including Makoto Shinkai's Your Name. Tateno, Nakagome, and Fujimura all remained as animation check staff, with Tateno releasing a tell-all memoir about Studio Ghibli after the studio's temporary closure in 2014. Asade never worked for Ghibli again after Porco Rosso. As an experiment, therefore, having Ghibli films made by women seems to have been short-lived and to have had little impact on the women temporarily promoted to the studio. Part of the issue facing women in anime seems to be the cul-de-sacs um, caused by specialization and gendered impressions of all kinds of work. The discourse around the abilities of women in shiage or finishing roles and more creative roles is different. But there's also certain roles, I think, like sakugaman or animator, gengaman, um, key animator, and henshuman, editor, that like cameraman in English are appended with man um, to indicate gender norms and expectations for the roles that linger on today. At Studio Ghibli, however, the most notable lack of presence for women is not in these roles, where women sometimes flourish, but at the very top levels of production. There has never been any female director at Studio Ghibli, as far as I can discern, not in feature films, short films, music videos, or even advertisements. Ruth Richards has written about an incident in which a former Ghibli producer and founder of Studio Ponic, Yoshiaki Nishimura said, or rather caused something, and I quote, something of a stir when he stated that whether or not Ghibli would ever hire a female director would depend on the type of film being made. Nishimura made the comments out of school having already left Studio Ghibli at the time, but part of the wider point here is that Studio Ghibli has never hired a woman to direct nor promoted a woman from amongst its ranks to be a director. It has done so for male directors and animators, but never for female animators. So while I agree with Richards that we should not let this cloud our view of women's contributions at the studio, it seems that there are inequalities remaining at Studio Ghibli despite its proclamations about women and despite its many independent, powerful female characters on screen. These powerful female characters, moreover, are not just created by the studio. They're often adaptations brought into Studio Ghibli from already extant literary sources, 
and worlds created by women, including worlds by Ursula Le Guin, Diana Wynne-Jones, and Eiko Tanaka, amongst others. These authors are probably the most famous women associated with Studio Ghibli. They're internationally re renowned and translated, and their adaptations into Studio Ghibli films have given new life to their independent, resourceful, powerful female characters. It's not always easy, therefore, to see where Miyazaki, Takahata, and their fellow male animation directors' contribution begin, and um, when many of their most famous literary characters or, or famous female characters are imported into animation from pre-existing literary worlds. Moreover, when women, the women around them in the studio inspire the characters' personalities, and when that same army of women animates them, we need to consider who has contributed what to the story worlds of Studio Ghibli by asking what it is that Studio Ghibli does that is actually feminist. Therefore, we can see how important a wide range of women have been to the studio's success across its industrial history. Women became important, an important audience for Studio Ghibli's films in the late 80s and early 90s, and this in turn caused Studio Ghibli to throw a spotlight, albeit briefly, on the women who worked to make their films. In response, those women openly questioned and critiqued the studio's feminist politics and its industrial culture. In doing so, figures like Tanaka, Kagawa, Futaki, Tateno, and perhaps especially Fujimura show their awareness of being used as a prop in a male-dominated and often grueling animation system. So Studio Ghibli's famous female characters are lauded for their independence and complexity, but even this brief look behind the scenes shows an equally complex set of issues facing the women who made those characters as they tried to assert their significance within Studio Ghibli's production culture. Studio Ghibli is not an unambiguously or straightforwardly feminist studio, but nor is the studio entirely deaf to the needs of its staff members, whatever their gender. Ghibli's worlds of women, therefore, are not maybe ideals, but imperfect reflections of the industrial landscape from which they were created. And I'll finish up there. <laughs> I'll also just shut the curtain so I can actually see you all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Raina, for that fascinating um, talk. I'll just wait for you to close your <laughs> curtains. <laughs> I think we've got a couple of um, uh, great questions coming up. Um, actually, so I'm going to read them out um, in minutes. But um, yeah, I think I, you know, I was really struck as well. I think before your talk, I was contemplating um, the significance of people working behind the scenes in a um, in a animation or film studio. And um, in a way, I was sort of thinking as a viewer and as you know, as a, you know in terms of global audiences, the very fact that you have um, more roles now uh, where women are the, the protagonists um, and the heroines, that is actually having a huge impact on you know, how girls grow up conceiving of themselves um, and, and thinking about their possibilities. So that does seem to be such a significant contribution in one sense, but I think what really came across in your talk um, to me today was the, the intersection between these two worlds and the very fact that uh, uh, Ghibli are trying to sort of, um, in a way, you know, fabricate a world of gender equality. Um, and as you point out as well, you know, that uh, you can look at the female protagonists and, and, and characters in the films in multiple, multiple ways. So, um, yeah, it's a huge uh, amounts of food for thought in this talk um, to get to the bottom of, really. So that was just my, um, the main thing I was sort of contemplating plating in terms of rec uh, reconciling them. One more thing I was sort of really struck by was thinking about the working culture in Japan. And that it, it, it just goes, I mean, far beyond Studio uh, Ghibli oh, that yeah. in, in, in all aspects of life. Uh, I think one of the most um, problematic things for equality of women is the fact that you've got this working culture, which in itself um, is, is, has been for such a long time a male dominated arena, but imposes conditions, which means it is absolutely, as you say, sort of impossible to pursue um, that life and, you know, having a family and so on. And so I think that, you know, is, is an issue um, beyond Studio Ghibli 
too, uh, arguably, but certainly um, one in which you, one, it's extremely disappointing to reflect that so little has uh, advancement has been made on that um, situation. And, um, and yeah, small victories like having a, a larger toilet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Seems sort of comical in 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 consideration uh in in, in, in comparison to, to that. But um yes, was this is this something that you sort of uh, were also thinking about in terms of you know the representativeness? I mean obviously you touch on you know other anime companies and how much more awful they were than studio studio ghibli, but uh um, I mean, one thing in terms of overcoming uh, that issue is in terms of changing a sort of national culture as well. Um, and do you think it's, it, is there possibilities that one, co one company could pioneer that change? I mean, what's so, and I think Helen McCarthy, who was one of the first people to ever write about this subject, has just chimed in and she's absolutely right with what she's saying, by the way. Um, but yes, hi, Helen. Um, I think one of the, the things I really picked up on when I was doing the preparatory reading for the book was there's a really strong egalitarian theme that runs through both the things Miyazaki has said, the things um, Isao Takahata has said, but also the things academics have said about Studio Ghibli, that this idea of coming out of the, the kind of Toei Doga system and the union at Toei Doga in the 1960s was something that sparked Miyazaki's interest, in particular Miyazaki's interest in egalitarian working practices. And, and, and it's, it's interesting, it's limited. I think, you know, you have to remember as you're looking at the studio, of course, that Studio Ghibli was a, a subsidiary of a parent company, which was a publisher, um, Tokuma Shoten, very kind of seemingly, if you read Stephen Alpert's book, um, seemingly a kind of quixotic boss who um, landed them in debt with a, a subsidiary that he gave them that was already in debt before they ever got started. So they had to work very hard to, to kind of overcome that, that situation. And so it was, it was always very high risk, Studio Ghibli. And it took Miyazaki and his cohort of, of, of collaborators about, as I was saying, I think about five or six years to get to a point where they could actually start to enact the kind of things at the studio that they wanted to do in the first place. Um, and in doing so, they did set up a studio with permanent contracts or semi-permanent contracts that was quite different to other studios at the time, which were much more project by project, um, sort of on a you know basis that was very different. Um, in terms of the connections to wider society, the kind of it's diff it's difficult to map it onto any particular movement. Um, I haven't seen even in Hateno's book, uh, Tateno's book, I haven't seen a huge amount in there about unions at Studio Ghibli or talk of unions at Studio Ghibli. There's not a lot um, said about that certainly, and I think that's interesting given the starting point for people like Miyazaki and Takahata who. Were, and yes, actual Michio Yasuda, their, their color designer, who kind of met and, and got became friendly through their union activities at their first studio. Um, and, and the honest answer is I've, I've been looking at the promotional discourses, I've been looking at the things that have been written around the studio as far as possible, but there are gaps there. You know, some of this stuff was 30, 40 years ago, and it's not always easy to track what was happening within and around the studio at the time. Yeah. And what's more, the stories have changed over the years. Um, there's been a lot of repackaging of Studio Ghibli in its history. And I think in terms of wider Japanese society, of course, there are parallels there, but there's also disjunctures like, like Miyazaki's and, and Toshio Suzuki's attempts to create more egalitarian working practices, to give you know, people who will be spending a lot of time at the studio, a bit more space um, and places to rest within the studio. Um, the creche is a really big deal, I think, as well, in terms of creating a, a family friendly environment. But there are limits to those things and there are commercial you know, imperatives that limit them. Mm. 
Yes. That, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. No, 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 that does, that does. So it's, it's really interesting to hear that and reflect on that. And I, I could actually ask you another, I wanted to mention something, but I will leave it now because there's so many amazing questions and I'm going to get on to um, the first person that you actually mentioned, uh, Helen McCarthy. Mm -hmm. And she says, um, it's sad to reflect that even though progress is being made now, there hasn't been much since uh, Reiko Oku, uh, Okuyama and Kazuko Nak Nakamura fought their corner at Toei Doga. Mm -hmm. And she said, it's a very interesting point about Ghibli's failure to promote women to director, yeah. despite the studio's interest in adapting and using female creativity. Is Ghibli, in some sense, Miyazaki's way of replaying the experience of making Taiyo no Ko um, holes at Toei Doga, but with a successful outcome, both in uh, creative and operational terms. Feminism was no part of that enterprise, except incidentally as being part of the workers' collective system, and so might not have been a priority for Miyazaki and Takahata in uh, building the ideal working environment that would have allowed them to complete holes as they wished. I love that, Helen, thank you. I think it's a wonderful observation, and I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to imagine what might have been with Hulls. I, I think it's one of those texts that I think everyone would love to imagine what it would have looked like given if the if Miyazaki and Takahata were given free reign. Um, yes, I agree with you. I think the feminism is an interesting one in terms of Japanese culture and Japanese history. Of course, it, you know, Japanese feminist history is not exactly comparable to what we would think of the feminist narrative over here. So there are significant differences there. And I think, you know, we see academics now almost kind of retroactively applying terms to Miyazaki's movies like eco-feminism, um, re kind of reinscribing those characters of his with qualities that I'm not sure he was seeking to, to give them. Um, but at the same time, there's that openness of his texts to give us a sense, you know, that, that allows us to rethink what's their potential and what their possibilities are. Um, the fact that so many of Miyazaki's heroines have been scrutinized in relation to feminism, I think is fascinating in its own right, given that most of them are not adults, but young girls. And there's, there's a certain, I suppose, freedom in being a young girl, um, not yet defined by society that he's working through over and over again through those shoujo characters. So I, I think you're right, at Helen, absolutely right in, in the things you're saying. Um, I think he, he, did, he does care, Miyazaki and, and Takahata too. And I think they were interested in creating a good environment for their staff members. But I, I don't know if it's an ideal that they're working towards or a set of principles. And, and they did have principles that they were working towards when they set up Studio Ghibli. And that idea of having permanent contracts was one of those ideals, but feminism wasn't one of them. Hmm. So that's, that's really, interesting. really interesting to hear. I mean, I suppose I, I wonder, and, it's, and this sort of calculation would be really difficult to make, but to what extent were, you know, the, the pressures, economic pressures, uh, a factor in the eventual culture that gets created by a uh, given animation studios you know if you're in a, a situation where everyone is in the these working in these harsh mm -hmm. conditions and rushing to um to yeah. produce and finish something um that is of such a high standard and um i want you know i wonder to what extent reality sort of interferes economic reality interferes with that but that, that does sound like when i say that that is a complete cop out but well, you know they, and you know it's it's not like having jobs that are done by women at a studio it, that's not a bad thing it's a great thing that women are being hired mm -hmm. in animation studios i just wish there were more of them higher up the, yes. the hierarchy yeah yeah you know? Yeah, um, particularly at Studio Ghibli. Uh, I think what's interesting is, you know, if you watch something like the, the Kingdom of Dreams and Madness, um, which is a documentary made about the studio, one of the things that's interesting there is you see Miyazaki often at, at his desk coming into the studio surrounded by people and often the people he works with most closely are women. He's got this lifelong relationship with, or kind of career long relationship with color designer Michio Yasuda, which is fascinating because he calls her one of his nakama or kind of, his, his collaborator friends. Um, 
and he, she's an insider in his world and he will go to her often in the, the making of documentaries for the films. You can see him deferring to her and going to her when he's not sure about things. Mm -hmm. So, and that's one of the things I, I wanted to, to point out in the book is that there's all this work being done by women outside of their, their hired roles that they're credited for. Yeah. Um, where they're doing collaborative, you know, collaborative work with Miyazaki, helping him solve problems, doing things that maybe they're not given story credits or something like that for. And I think it's it's fascinating to see that collaborative practice, that that kind of industrial practice at work. And one of the fascinating things is because Studio Ghibli has been so famous, it's had lots and lots of time with NHK documentary crews behind the scenes looking at its production processes and often things creep out into those documentaries that you might you know that we might not see of lesser known studios from that time mm. um, so I think it's fast I mean this is a fascinating world I'm just I'm hoping today I've just opened the door to more work on these studios in this period because I think a, a couple of people have, have mentioned um, I think Mark uh, hi Mark and and Helena both talked about Reiko Okuyama, and she's a hugely important figure in the history of anime. And again, she's probably, if I had to name the most feminist kind of filmmaker and most successful female animator in Japan, they'd probably both be the same person and would be Okuyama. So thank you guys for mentioning her. <laughs> Can, can, on that note, can I read Mark's question then? Yes, he says, I realize this is a J-drama and not supposed to be accurate, but uh, are you familiar with the show Natsuzora, which is loosely based on the life of the animator Vieko Okuyama? If you do know about it, can you speak uh, to uh, about the show and what you think about it? I haven't seen it, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I find I, if you know where I could possibly get hold of it, Mark, I would love to watch it. Um, so do do send me an email if you know. Um, I know about her a little bit from having um, obviously read work by Helen and others who've talked about her. Um, I haven't done my own research on her though. I just know her reputation and it is, she is very central to all of this, I think today. And she's maybe, maybe even the starting point for some of it. Oh, really? Fantastic. Thank you so much. So um, we've got another question from Alice Marks, who says, hello, Raina. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. I'd be really interested to know who your favourite female Ghibli character is and why. So hard to answer that question. That's like <laughs> asking me what my favourite Ghibli film is, and it depends on the day mm. of the week and the, the time of the day, I think. Um, I, I, I have spent a career looking at these movies and I think for me one of the fun things about looking at these movies is there's always something new to see in them and I think the more you look at them the more you get out of them which is really nice um, so having having just looked at um, Okama from Castle in the Sky for example you know that's a character who was in the background of a couple of shots I thought she was interesting never gave her a second thought until I was doing this this paper and, and then kind of realized just how interesting she is in terms of, of representational strategies that they're using that kind of physical strength matched to her kind of strength of character and her her kind of ability to cross between um, domestic her domestic role as a mother and wife and also her her societal role as a leader in her community and she's on screen for maybe a couple of minutes so yeah. I think the more you look at these movies, the more characters like that you find, um, the more interesting outlandish characters in Miyazaki's films are almost always women. Um, sure. I've, got a, I've got a soft spot for a couple of them. You know, San, of course, is, yeah. is, is a character I've spent a lot of time thinking about, but um, Princess Mononoke. But I think we all have our favorites, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is hard to, to say just one. <laughs> I mean, that strikes me, you know, that's something that you were talking about in your talk. Um, and that was that is very clear, I think, uh, to the audience is that there, there is this sort of rich diversity mm -hmm. um, uh, in his films and or in, in, in Ghibli's films and, and diversity of representation. And yeah. that, in a sense, is, you know, it seems to me to be hugely sort of uh, powerful, innovative and uh, 
you know heartening thing to to behold so um yeah fantastic let me move on to the next question which is from Lawrence Green hi Lawrence um he says one thing that struck me is that in comparison with anime in manga at least many women have achieved headline roles and become very famous mangaka or authors such as Clamp Sailor Moon oh that's my daughter loves Sailor Moon, uh, Naoko Takeuchi, um, the two industries presumably must be to a degree drawing on an overlap of creative young talent uh, who can draw, draw well. So I do wonder what encourages some to go down the anime route and others to go the manga author route. That's a really great question. Yeah, I mean, it absolutely is. Um, so there's something called the media mix in Japan that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, but the media mix often runs from a manga creation through anime to live action or animated film and beyond. Um, and that's Japan's version of franchising. What's interesting to me is, I, I think two, two elements of this. One, the cost of training. So being a, a young mangaka is relatively comparatively inexpensive versus becoming a trained animator, which does require, I mean, unless you have amazing ability to sit and watch a thousand YouTube videos and then create your own practice out of it, perhaps it, there's been a democratization of that in recent years, but certainly the practices of making animation more complex, more costly, and there are barriers to entry that involve training. So the fact that Ghibli was hiring young people and then training them was actually important, even though the, apparently the school, the training school never really worked very well at Ghibli. Um, but I think that's an interesting difference to the mangaka. The mangaka you know, can come out of, like Clamp, um, fan, dojin, um, kind of amateur work, and then become industry favorites, be kind of ported in from industry from amateur work. Um, Others work in, you know, as trained illustrators and then become mangaka, but often I think there's just less of a barrier to entry. So women's creativity gets a bit more space. Um, and there's interesting stories to tell there in the history of manga as well, the kind of emergence of powerful groups of female creators that help form and reform women's genres in Japanese um, manga. You know, there are movements within that that go back at least as far as the 1960s, so, or 1960s, 70s. Um, but I think there's, it's a different medium, it's a different history, it's also a different set of training needs. Um, so that might explain some of it, Lawrence. No, it's a great question though. Yeah. And I wonder, I wonder how many women are put off just by the low pay at the bottom of the market, the long hours and low pay. Um, Certainly, there have been a couple of big surveys done of Japanese uh, of the Japanese animation industry, and those indicate a real burnout at the bottom of the industry, people not staying in it for more than a few years. Mm. Yeah, I can sort of imagine. I, it just seems like such a competitive world as well. I mean, young people in Japan, there are so many who are anime fans, so many who produce, you know, uh, their, their sort of fan works from a very young age. So um, it, it must be a hugely competitive arena as well. And to want to stay in it, you must really want to sort of have or have to want to give your, 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 your life or soul to it in a way. Um, yeah. I mean, yes, I'm going to just... Of, for, for those who are interested, there's a lot of mangaka who are now making their own um, kind of autobiographical stories about their lives and the way they got into industry. Um, we haven't mm. seen as much of that in English by female animators yet. Mm. I, think I think it's really interesting to see that. Um, mm. There's also television shows about the anime industry, of course, and about the manga industry. Um, things like Bakuman and Shirobako would be good places to start if you're interested. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Right, so I have we got time? I think we've got a time for just a few more questions if okay, you can sure. bear with us for a little longer we've got some uh, questions in the chat that i'm going to turn to there's one from uh han jing Liu, and she uh says regarding this point um and she's talking about oh there's sorry there's an earlier question about disney and sleeping beauty um i'm concerned about promoting women as the director um 
because there has uh, been an un unequal position in the working environment in Japan uh, mm. based on gender discrimination. So yes, but I think we've sort of touched on that really, haven't we, about um, women not making it to director level. And it, I think it really reminded me of the situation in Hollywood as well, and the fact yeah. that you saw so many, so few women there um, as directors, but we're only just starting to see um, that happen and for women directors to win big awards and so on. So. Um, who knows? I don't know. What's your sense of it in Japan? I, I sort of feel like maybe the tide is turning, um, at least with at least regard to the US. You yeah. Know, there's been a really important movement in feminist film history from academics as well. Um, there's a fantastic group, if anyone's interested, called Women in Animation that's looking um, in particular at trying to, trying to take a, a snapshot and trying to grasp just who is working in animation and particularly in North America at the moment. So there's a lot more attention being paid to these issues now than has ever been the case before. And it's really important that we keep moving in these directions because it's not just it's not just about women. It's also about minorities. It's also about um, representation of different kinds. And so these are important questions that we're only just getting to a critical mass of, of academics now to be able to start asking. And I'm really excited to to hopefully contribute just a little bit to that discussion because it's it's going to be, I think, hugely important for the next couple of generations of scholars. Mm, absolutely, I, I, I think so too. Um, so just one last question I think we have time for. I've got one from uh, Richard McCulloch and he says, uh, fascinating talk, Raina. I'd love to know a little bit more about um, the different reception contexts that these conversations around feminism and Ghibli are taking place in. In an Anglo-American context, for instance, we've seen film entertainment studios make a concerted effort to fund, promote, and generally talk about different forms of inequality. Um, as Sarah Bannett Weiser argues, feminism and other forms of social activism have become valuable commodities in the 21st century. Does feminism have the same value appeal in Japan, or is Ghibli an outlier in promoting itself in this way? Um, I love the question, Rich, and thank you so much for being here. Hi, nice to have you here. Um, I think there's um okay two things so first i think ghibli was unusual in the way it set up its studio in the way it dealt with its um contracts and the way it shifted from doing things the way the industry usually did them which is project by project piecework kind of if not piecework then short-term contracts um to moving to more permanent setup and that is unusual um and and is worth noting particularly in the early 1990s um, that benefits women, it benefits every employee, of course, to be on a permanent contract, and I think it's an important thing to think about. But um, in terms of feminist receptions, it's been fascinating to watch, particularly um, if you look at Emma's piece on, on Princess Mononoke, it's been fascinating for me to watch the change in discourse just across my career in the West, so sorry, in Europe and America. We've seen a, a kind of shift from a discussion of, of maybe fantasy and genre within these movies to a shift towards representation and discussions of more kind of feminist issues in recent years. And that includes academia as well as popular reception. Um, and I think that's indicative of maybe of the zeitgeist of the times during the, the studio's life. Um, in Japan, it, I've looked mostly at the promotional narrative that Ghibli has been putting out itself across that period of 30 years or so. And this is the height, like 1992 is the moment it highlights women. That is the time where women are most important and have most presence in the studio's discourse about itself. Um, women are not unimportant otherwise. Miyazaki is often shown surrounded by women um, or in conversation with women or um, shown in, in in collaboration with women authors in particular, but in terms of the studio talking about what it's trying to do and whether or not that is feminist, there's an interesting moment here in the, in the early 1990s, I think, where all of, it, all of those ideas come to a head. And it's interesting to me that they come to a head at the moment where the studio becomes permanent. 
So I found that that juxtaposition really fascinating. Mm. Outside of that in Japan, there is work on whether or not Studio Ghibli is feminist and there is discussion about it. Um, whether it, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm prevaricating because it's not, it's not like a consistent thing. It happens around particular characters, particular moments, particular debates. So when Tatiana releases her tell-all book about how Miyazaki making her look at the stripes on a particular shirt nearly drove her crazy. Um, you know, there, there, are mo there are little moments where women are pushing back against the studio's positive narrative about itself. And those are, are moments where we see heightened discussion about whether or not Studio Ghibli is really all that feminist after all. I, don't, I hope that helps. Yeah, no, it yeah. does, it does. <laughs> it gives me so much to sort of, um, and everyone so much to think about and contemplate. And I think feminism in Japan is a complex and difficult discussion really. And just even sort of starting it um, uh, seems like a very, sort of important step and, and looking and scrutinizing, um, you know, holding it up and, 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 and talking about what is feminism and what, what does real feminism mean in a practical sense um, and not just in a sort of idealistic, idealized space. Um, and it is really, uh, it, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's something that, you know, of course, I, my own research looks at sort of feminism in connection with the literature. And, um, uh, you know, I sort of feel that sometimes there's a sensitivity around, um, particularly as a scholar from, um, you know, yeah. the UK, looking at Japan, looking at Japanese literature yeah. and certain writers who don't, um, uh, identify uh, as feminist um, and the very definition of feminism being sort of different in Japan and then people who do identify as feminists being very sort of protective around how um, out outsiders might seek to identify various uh, texts and so on so it is a it's a really <laughs> difficult discussion Thorny, right <laughs> yeah yeah there, there's there's a a disjuncture between what feminism is inside and outside of japan there's also a disjuncture about how feminism has developed inside and outside of japan there are differences in the way women talk about their work within and outside of those discourses um i think for me, what was really heartwarming in this moment in 1991, when women women animators are being asked, are you handicapped by your gender? They just turned around and immediately went, no, <laughs> not here anyway. And that was really heartwarming for me because I was mm. expecting them to prevaricate. And they said, well, maybe outside of the studio, but not within it. And that I think tells you a lot. They're, mm. they're quite defensive of the studio and its practices. So there clearly are really positive things for women about working at the studio, whether or not women ever reach the heights of Studio Ghibli. Um, certainly they cared about the studio they worked in and they were very loyal to it in many cases. Mm. So I think that tells you a lot when you're, you're talking about a big commercial industry and it's often quite exploitative. Mm. Yeah. It does, it does sound sort of it does, to to what I always sort of feel there's a temptation to want to end on a sort of positive note, <laughs> but, you know. Perhaps we perhaps we don't always have to, but I mean, in a way, um, surely the sort of trajectory of the 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 studio is to 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 go the whole hog and finally embrace uh, a woman as a, a director at some stage, know. and um, you know. I, honestly, I don't think it's going to happen at Studio Ghibli. I if I I wish I could say I thought it would, but the way they seem to be going at the moment is they have Goro Miyazaki's um, so Hayao Miyazaki's son hmm. seems to be taking over on the CGI side of things, and his father Hayao is winding down as he makes probably maybe I mean <laughs> Miyazaki retires all the time, so we never know when his last film will be. Um, but he is working on another film right now, and it seems to me the the impetus behind the studio is is that is in those two lines but with very little sense of how it's developing towards the future and and i think 2014 in the closure of the studio where it took on more of a library function and was 
looking to market and sell what they already had in the back catalogue is an indication of where the studio might go in the future. I think much more interesting in those terms are places like Kyoan. Um, Kyoto Animation mm. has already promoted women, given Naoko Yamada a couple of you know, big movie directing roles. Um, so I think those kinds of newer studios are maybe the places to look for yeah. changes in the industry now. Fantastic. Thing newer, it's been around longer. <laughs> but yeah, right. it's kind of emerging studios might be the places to look. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. Perhaps they hold the, the future as well. So um, great. Well, I think uh, we will allow you to uh, um, resume your non virtual life now. And But it's so, been so lovely to have you uh, here uh, on screen. And I hope we'll get you back in person at some yeah, point too. Um, but the best of luck with this uh, term and this semester of teaching and so on. Um, Thank you everyone and for coming. I appreciate it so much. And it's so nice to hear your questions. It's It's nice to get feedback on things you've been you've been working on so I really appreciate it thank you everyone yes thank you to our lovely audience too and thank you to you Raina um uh I hope to see you soon okay see you bye all soon. bye bye everyone <laughs>